Yeah. Great job. Great job. Well, change absolutely starts with us. And that, that's been really the focus of this series. Thanks, brother. And if this is a first time for you, you're watching for the first time, hello to our extended family online. Uh, we just want you to know that we have been dealing with some of the, the difficult subjects that are plaguing our culture today, and they've been politicized, but they're not political, they're spiritual. And uh, we talked about, <clears throat> first and foremost, you cannot offend me. And uh, based on some of the reactions over the last few uh, weeks, some of you missed that sermon, so you definitely want to get a copy of it. But, uh, you know, just making that choice that I'm not going to be offendable. I'm not going to be a person that gets offended uh, at every little thing that's done. As a matter of fact, I'm going to choose to be unoffendable. And then we talked about love, loving those from same-sex orientation to their view on environment that may be different than yours or abortion or uh, politics. And then last week, we celebrated our oneness by baptizing 32 people uh, in four services. And so, yeah, give God a hand. You know, you, you can keep cheering because we had 50 people come to Christ last weekend. 50 people. Somebody asked me, man, why did we have so many people come to Christ? We average about 27 people a week that come to know Christ for the first time as their Savior. But last week, many of those getting baptized brought their family members, brought their friends, brought people who never go to church but came for a baptism. And they came to know Jesus as their Savior. And guys, since January 1st, over 200 people have come to know Christ in the adult services. That's not children's, youth ministry, or any of the other 52 ministries in the church. That's just in our services. When you speak the gospel, the power of change is not the preacher. It's not the messenger. It's the message. It's the gospel of Jesus that changes lives. And so I want to encourage you that uh, when you bring people that don't know Jesus to this church, they will hear the good news about him and they will, many of them, come to know Christ as their Savior. And that's an amazing miracle. You know, when we plan these services, we plan, I'm going to just, this drives me crazy. I can't do it. Sorry. Um, when we plan our services, we plan them months in advance and uh, we planned this service Pastor Jason and I talked about the music, and he's like, hey, what do you think about this Toby Mac song? And I, I'm like, oh, that's perfect. And some of you know, I've, I've known, I met Toby, got to know him a little bit, 1987, when they first, when DC Talk first launched, uh, it was only their second concert. Uh, they were traveling with a band that I, I worked for uh, named DeGarmo and Key that was really popular in those days. And so getting to know uh, Toby and Michael and Kevin a little bit and just seeing their commitment to bridging uh, racial divides. Uh, you know, uh, Michael Tate's African-American, Kevin's white, and they called Toby uh, Vanilla Swirl. They said he's, uh, he's chocolate on the inside, white on the outside. And, uh, and so I had no idea that my kids were going to get Shelly and I tickets to his concert Friday night, the Hits Deep concert with Torn Wells and and a uh, bunch of other people, Jordan, uh, and uh, I'm trying to rank, uh, think of the other ones, Andre Cole, some of those that were there. Uh, and it was a great concert. It was amazing. But it was really cool to be there. The last time I had actually seen Toby and talked to him was 20 years ago in the Denver Coliseum when he took over after I got off the road, Adam, myself, and Shelly uh, as the worship band and uh, performance band for Dare to Share uh, he took over with Diverse City and did, I think, a year or two tour. 20 years, just like that. But what I love so much is as he came out Friday night, and I'm sure he did this last night in the concert as well, uh, he shared, he started his portion by talking about his son who died suddenly a month and a half ago, 21 years old. And he just shared how devastating it has been, but how grateful he is to the entire community of believers in Denver and around the world who have reached out to his family, how humble he is. He is, he is an unbelievable, humble guy. And then he goes, I know I'm going to see my son again. And he goes, not because he was good. He goes, he was my wild child. He goes, not because of a religion. He said, I'm going to see my son again because for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And he said, because Truett put his trust in Jesus. 
And he said, guys, if you believe that Jesus died for you and you trust in him, you are born again and you will go to heaven and nothing you've ever done, nothing you do today and nothing you do in the future will separate you from the love of God. And Toby has always been committed to the clear gospel. And man, he just, he just laid it out there right before he even started singing. And it was powerful. And I looked around that auditorium, probably 8,000 people, and I saw all these people from all different backgrounds, all different race, ethnicity. Uh, you could also see a lot of people that weren't Christians. You can always tell at a Christian concert the non-Christians. Because you see the Christians, especially the white ones that think they can dance, uh, <laughs> like us, and, uh, and that's not a racial statement, all right? Just chill. And, uh, and they're standing there, and the person that doesn't know Jesus is like this. Just looking like they're singing about Jesus. What is this? And, and then you see as he gave the gospel, you see defenses break down. And it was just, man, it was awesome. And I went, this is a microcosm of heaven. This is what it's going to look like in heaven, only with millions, even billions of saints from every tongue, every nation, every crowd. And guys, we've talked about this theme, love no matter what. And this is not just a tagline for our ministry. This is what embodies who we are. We are hope for everyone and a home for anyone. That's what our ministry is. That's our mission statement. But we are going to live that out by love no matter what. I was standing in line at Tokyo Joe's uh, last week, and there was this young girl, probably 25 to 30-ish, standing in front of me. And she turned around, and she's just like staring at me. And I'm just like... <laughs> And all of a sudden she goes, I am not checking you out. I go, I didn't think so. I mean, to be my daughter and, you know. But she goes, what does your shirt say? And I said, oh, I had the short sleeved one on. I said, love no matter what. Oh, cool, man. Yeah, she goes, that's cool. I go, yeah, I'm a pastor. And I, she flips around. <laughs> Apparently she doesn't adhere to love no matter what. But uh, you know, it's good for people to hear that, love no matter what. And, and the central theme of this series as we have covered all of these subjects is Proverbs 19.11. Let's look at it again. Next week, we're going to deal with, two for two weeks, uh, another difficult topic. And how do, we, how do we get to the place in 2020 where our finances are really um, balanced and we're out of debt and we're in that place? And believe it or not, the Bible speaks directly to this. And every time uh, we preach on this subject, I always get people saying, oh, I thought it was just going to be about giving. No. God talks about stewardship and balancing your checkbook and keeping records and all those practical things we'll talk about. And we've got to have Proverbs 19.11 as our verse for this year. 2020 vision. Look at this. A wise person demonstrates patience, for mercy means holding your tongue. When you are insulted, be quick to forgive and forget it. For you are virtuous when you overlook an offense. If you haven't memorized that, memorize it. That really should be a verse that drives you. I know, I actually know Christians. I've had some people in this church actually say to me, that is not true. We are supposed to be offended at sin. I'm like, chapter and verse. Because it ain't in there. It's God's job to judge the sin and the sinner. It is my job to love no matter what. And if I get offended, that means I've elevated myself to a position of judgment over that person for whatever reason. So Proverbs is really the balance of our approach. Now look at John 13. The tagline of our ministry is this. Take a look at this. So I give you now a new commandment. This is what Jesus said to the disciples. And he said, this is how I want you to be known as a Christian. He said, I give you a new commandment. Love each other just as much as I have loved you. For when you demonstrate the same love I have for you by loving one another, everyone will know that you are my true followers. Guys, it doesn't say by quoting more verses than anybody, they'll know you're my followers. It doesn't say by not sinning or not going to places where they're sinners you'll be my followers or people will know you're my followers. It doesn't say by being generous because even people that don't know Jesus are generous, many of them. It says by your love. And when you look at that, you say, wait, 
was that really a new commandment? I mean, is there a contradiction here? Is this, is this a mistake? No. Jesus was saying this. You've seen the commandments, the Ten Commandments, the commandments of the law. Let me sum them up in this new commandment. And by the way, if you look at the Ten Commandments, they're summed up this way. The first four commandments are loving God, about loving God, and the last six are about loving each other. So loving God and loving others. We need to be known by our love. Now, Bob Dylan, one of the greatest lyricists of the past hundred years or more, said this, the times, they are changing. And they are always changing. And over the last six years, unless you've had your head buried in the sand or completely missed it, we are again at a critical place of civil rights in this country. And obviously, we see the Ferguson shooting, Michael Brown and police officers. We have different sides of that story. I have a, a friend who's from uh, that part of Missouri and talks about how just devastating it is for both sides. And we look at this whole Black Lives Matter, you know, kind of the anarchy approach to rights. And we say, what should be our approach? I, I've actually had some people say this. They haven't said it directly to me, but they've sent an email or talked to someone in a small group say, why is he covering these subjects? Why are we talking about these subjects? Believe it or not, there are Christians who actually just think when we get together, we're supposed to, you know, let, tell me about the Hittites one more time, Pastor Rick. Read another psalm. Give me some touchy-feely stuff. And yet the Bible makes it clear that it is teaching us how to live in our current day and age. It is a relevant book. I don't make it relevant. It's relevant to our lives because it's alive. Matter of fact, look at one of the oldest books in the Bible. Look at 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32, and see if this doesn't drive what we do. I'll tell you, this is one of the verses that I teach when I teach preaching seminars is this verse. Look at it. From Issachar's descendants, there were 200 leaders. So leaders who understood their times, circle that, and knew what Israel should do. Underline that. you got to know your time and the times you live in, and you've got to be able to teach the people you're leading, your families, if you're a business owner or manager, all of us have leadership responsibilities at one level or another. You've got to be able to communicate how to live in this day and age. That word literally means, understanding literally means to have skillful insight and know how to avoid evil. Guys, I'm going to tell you something about racism. It still exists. Racism is still a cultural crisis. And I, you know, you might, oh, there's really not any racism. You live in lily white Arvada, if you think that. But there are 38 other cities represented in this church that we know of. And there are people on the other side of the tracks that would tell you different. And I, coming from a pastor who has a multicultural, multi-ethnic ministry, I am here to tell you it still exists. And it's not just white toward black or even black toward white. It also has to do with all races, Hispanic, Asian. You know, we have a large Russian community here in Arvada. We have many Russian believers in our church. And so we have all different people. If you want to see how multicultural, multi-ethnic we are, you have to come to church on a weekend for all four services for a month. We have thousands who watch online, but let me tell you something about those who come to church here. The average member in America, the average Christian goes to church once every three to four weeks. So if you come every week, oh, you got a gold star in heaven. No doubt, all right? You should. You shouldn't want to miss it. But the average Christian goes to church once every three to four weeks. And so if you want to see how large our congregation is and see all the different people, you got to be here, all four services for a month. And I would encourage you to try that sometime. It won't kill you. I've done it for 35 years. And it will help you actually understand how amazing our ministry is. But... We're nowhere near where we need to be. We're still not representing all the ethnicities in our community well. You know, I saw racism 
in a very ugly way 22 years ago. When I first went to the Amazon, and I'm not speaking of Peruvian people in a negative way, I'm talking about mestizos, which are half indigenous, half Peruvian nationals who live in the Huayaga Valley near the Amazon or in the Amazon jungle near the indigenous. And they had enslaved the indigenous people up until 1980. When we started working there in 1997, 98, I said, man, I want to bring these uh, indigenous pastors down the river. And Paul Johnson, who was our who really our mentor, our guide, had been working in the Amazon for 50 years now. He said, you can't, Rick. I said, why? We, we'll pay. We'll do. And he said, no, no, no. If you bring them down to Uramaguas, many of them get beat, raped, murdered. And so three of them ended up coming, and we had to put them up in our hostel. We had to watch out for them. And listen, I've walked down the streets with indigenous in that kind of culture. It's ugly. Now, it's better today. It's not all healed up, but 22 years later, we have been predominantly the church that has introduced the indigenous Shawi people, of which there are 58,000 of them, into the city, the jungle city of Uramaguas. Isn't it interesting that people who are half indigenous hate the indigenous? Does that even make sense? Guys, Racism is a cultural problem. And you know what else? Racism is not a skin problem. It's a sin problem. It's a sin problem that starts in the heart. And I know that some of you are probably sitting there going, I'm not a racist. Oh, come on. You know, tell this to some racist. That's, that's not true. I'm going to give you what I spent a few months on, which is the six degrees of racism as I've defined them, as socio, uh, you know, sociological studies I've done uh, biblically. Here's what I see, and if you inverted these six principles I'm about to lay out, or these six degrees, uh, it would start with kind of the base racism, but I'm going to end with that. I want to show you, first of all, the six degrees of racism, and you ask that question. Be honest with God. Lord, show me if I'm racist, and show me if I've done all I can to heal racism. First of all, there's the first level, or first degree, I'm a racist, and I'm proud of it. There are actually people, and I'm sad to say, even some Christians who make no bones about their racism. They say it. And there's no place for that in the church. There's no place for racism in the life of any Christian, ever, of any kind. But most of you are going, wow, gosh, I can't believe that. Well, here's the, the, the second degree of racism. I'm a bigot, so I'm not really a racist. I'm just a bigot. I mean, yeah, I look down on some people. I judge people not just by the color of their skin, by their tattoos, by their hair, by their whatever, and you fill in the blank. You're bigoted. You have this superiority complex. You say, well, that's not really me. How about this one? I'm prejudiced, and race is only part of how I judge people. You know what? You can be honest about this by saying or asking yourself this question. Have I ever looked at a people group and said, well, you know, those people are like this? Then you're prejudiced. Here's another one. I'm unaware of racism that still exists. And I kind of like that. Just unaware. You know, I live here in Arvada. There's not really any racism, really. In 1956, this was the site of 10,000 people marching from here to the Capitol for the Ku Klux Klan. When I grew up in Arvada, we moved from North Denver. In 1977, the only African-American people I knew in Arvada lived in my house. They were African-American girls. A few Hispanics, too. And that's all changing, thank God, because it should, because America is not about white people. And by the way, if you think you're a white American, you need to Ancestry.com to teach you that you're Heinz 57, okay? Ain't, there is no such thing as white America, and yet there's that mentality. You know what a, another degree is? I'm apathetic, and I don't care if there's still racism, People say, ah, I just don't watch the news. I, I, you know, I don't, I don't really get into those topics. I, I, 
I don't worry about it politically. Oh, that's just a political arguing point. No, it's not. And if you are a Christian who is apathetic, that's the worst place you can be. Because apathy is worse than hate or love. And what I mean by worse than love is that at least with love, you'll have that line at times where you get upset with the person you love and it can turn to hate really quickly. But at least you know where somebody stands. When they're apathetic, they don't stand anywhere. And finally, I'm compassionate, but I'm inactive when it comes to fighting racism. Now, that's where most Christians live. Oh, I'm compassionate, sure. And a lot of us have said, man, I'm being polarized by this whole racial argument in politics and in the community. Hey, I get it. I get it where today we live in the cancel culture, the woke culture, which I mean instantly the moment you say anything or you did something 40 years ago that offended some people group, it's racism. No, it's not. 42 years ago, I dressed up like Mean Joe Green, who was African-American. And me and my brother did a commercial for a big gong show thing that the group homes had. Remember the old Mean Joe? Hey, Mean Joe, you want my Pepsi or Coke, whatever it was? And then he's like, here, kid, here's my jersey, catch. And we just made three funny skits out of it. So was I racist because I was a black person in that? No. And I don't get mad if a black person plays me. Or if a white person plays a Native American. But, but we're so overtly sensitive. Now, some would say, wait a second, you're not being sensitive to the ugliness that happened in this country 150 years ago and before. Oh yeah, I'm very sensitive to that. It's, a, it's an ugly stain on the soul of this country. But that doesn't negate the fact that there were still great men and women who founded this country and sacrificed for this country, even if they had some blind spots. Do you have some blind spots? We all do. And you know what? You don't have to be white to be racist. You can be black and racist, Hispanic and racist, uh, you know, and the list goes on. So what do we do about this? Well, the first thing we need to understand is God says there's only one race. It's the human race. There's only one group of people, it's the human race. As a matter of fact, before sin infected the world, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, and I want to read this to you. So God created human beings in his own image. Circle human beings and underline in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. By the way, he said there's men, and there's women, and that's it. And I created them, and you're all part of the human race, so get over yourself. Now, God created diversity. Man created disharmony. Sin brought disharmony. So let me explain how it happened. God created man and woman. Um, I'm just going to give you a, a little anthropological uh, argument here. If Adam and Eve were created and placed in the fertile crescent between the uh, Euphrates and Tigris River in the Mesopotamian Valley, just above the Middle East, they were not white. <laughs> the melanin in their skin was dark. And Jesus wasn't white. That's why I get bothered by these movies. Have this six foot two white guy with big blue eyes. That wasn't Jesus. He's probably 5'8". That would have been a tall Jew. He was dark skinned, probably had a big nose like me. I mean, that's Jesus. And, and so we got to get over this mindset, this preconceived notion. People ask me all the time, where did the ethnicities get spread out? Well, God created man. He said, I want you to be fruitful, multiply, and scatter throughout the earth. And you know what happened after the flood? Man started thinking very, really highly of himself. He started forming uh, allegiances. He became extremely segregated in saying, we're going to all come together and do our own thing. Matter of fact, the Tower of Babel, they built a ziggurat, which is a tower. God was not afraid in Genesis 11 that they were going to reach heaven and take over. As a matter of fact, in Genesis 11, it doesn't say that God cursed them by confusing their language. It says God confused their languages and spread them out 
Why? Because they had become like most Christians, lazy. Their butts were glued to their chair and they were not spreading the love of God around the world. Look at Genesis 11. In that way, he scattered, the Lord scattered them all over the world and they stopped building the city. That is why the city was called Babel because that is where the Lord confused the people with different languages. In this way, he scattered them all over the world. I never cease to be amazed at how pastors oftentimes make the Bible say what they want to say rather than what it says. It doesn't say that he cursed them. It says he confused their languages. In other words, he multiplied the ethnicity and he spread them out. Why? Because God loves diversity. Now, I believe in Pangea. I believe that the earth was one landmass. After the flood, a cataclysmic event, it, it started to break apart and separate, play tectonic shift. And that when God spread man out, he spread him out into different places. And then based on, I do believe in this, God created adaptation that bodies and skin colors adapted to their environment. Now, I don't believe in evolution. You can believe in evolution and be a Christian and go to heaven. Don't worry about it, okay? You got a lot more faith than me. But let me say this about evolution. At its core, it's racist. Christianity is not racist. The Bible is not racist. That's a mistranslation and a misinterpretation. The Bible is about loving all people. But you go back to the historical founding and the historical teaching of evolution. Stephen Jay Gould, one of the most respected Harvard um, uh, professors in the 1880s, taught this, that people, and he was talking primarily about Africans, African Americans, but he also talked about other races, people that were not white had not evolved totally. And at its core... It's very racist. It just doesn't make the headlines anymore. Now, Christianity is about loving everyone. So what's at the core of racism? Before we talk about how to heal this problem in our country, in our world, we got to look at what's at the core. And there are three sins at the core of racism in every single person without exception. And the first is this. I'm better than you in some way. You have to honestly believe that you are better. Well, you know, my pedigree's better. I live on the other side of the tracks. My parents made more money. We lived in a suburban house. Gentrification has pushed the inner city into the communities and the suburbs. So today... Many of the inner cities in America are too expensive for minorities to live because there is still a broad gap uh, in, in uh, economy and finances and income. And so it has forced minority groups who are not going to be minority very long, by the way, into the suburbs. And now we have this diversion or this diversity clash happening in our neighborhoods and America doesn't know how to handle it. You know, Jesus tells us how to handle it. Paul told us how to handle it in Philippians 2. Look at this. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take on the interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Who did Jesus hang with? Everybody. Who did Jesus love? Everybody. Do you know the only people Jesus didn't hang out with? Arrogant religious people who were, by the way, racist and bigoted. There was a study done. <laughs> the irony in this study, okay? And uh, I, I got to be careful because every time I say this, I, I get some emails. Uh, I said, Mormons are not Christians, okay? L let, me, let me clear something up. It doesn't matter if you're Mormon, Catholic, Jehovah's Witness, whatever. If you believe in the Jesus of the Bible and you have trusted in his death, burial, and resurrection and you have said, I'm a sinner and I need a savior and you trust in him, God in the flesh, 
You're a Christian, doesn't matter what religion you're a part of, but I am here to tell you that the Jesus of Mormonism is not the Jesus of the Bible. He is created. He is not God. His death on the cross wasn't enough to pay for our sins completely. So they are not believing in the same Jesus. And by the way, Mormonism is about 160 years old. That's it. And it was founded on very racist beliefs. Do you know that the university, Brigham Young University, had taught, as did Brigham Young and Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism, that black people could not be part of the royal priesthood. And in BYU, they didn't even allow black people until 1978. And June 5th, 1978, the prophets of the Mormon church went up in some room and said, oh, you know, God had it wrong for 120 years. We're going to let black people in. You know why? Their football and basketball teams weren't very competitive. That's not a racist statement. It's a racist reality. Guys, if you founded something on that belief system, you're a racist at the core. And so they changed that belief. They changed that doctrine. My Bible says God loves everyone. But Brigham Young did a study, and it was a three-year study, and they studied the NBA, and they found out that black refs call 20% more fouls on white players, and white refs call 20% more fouls on black players. Racism still exists. So we start out, I'm better than you in some way. You know what else? I'm more valuable than you are. There's a little bit of difference there. You can be better thinking you're better based on what you do, but value actually says, God loves me more. There were people who misinterpreted, mistranslated the Bible and taught that black people and Hispanic people and people of mixed race could not go to heaven. Sickening. Look at Acts 10. Then Peter replied, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. In every nation, he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. Guys, we don't believe every book in the Bible is, you know, inspired. We don't believe every verse is inspired. We believe every word is inspired. And it is there for a reason. And when the Bible says every nation, he means every nation, every people group. And you know what else is at the core of racism? Not just I'm more valuable, I'm loved more by God than you are. You know, I'm going to tell you something. If you think that perpetuating this lie that there are the predominant majority of Americans and we are white and then there's the minorities and there are all other groups, you are about to have a very rude awakening. In 2040, 20 years from now, the population of Hispanic Americans will go from 46 million to 132 million. The population of African Americans will go from 41 million to 68 million. The growth of Asian Americans will go from 16 million to 40 million. And then who will be the minority? Well, if we keep segregating everyone that's not part of the biggest group. And God says, no, 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 no. I love everybody. Look at this. For God so loved the world. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that, circle it, everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Everyone who trusts in him. So you look at what's happening in this country with racism. I agree that the media perpetuates a, a lie that every cop is a hater of black people. That's not true. As a matter of fact, it's a minority of bad cops that do this. And that every black man is a thug. Or that every black home, uh, you know, is a single parent black home. Or, or that every Hispanic is an illegal immigrant or whatever. Those are perpetuated lies for the very purpose of controlling society's thought process and selling papers and getting you to watch their TV channels and be totally uh, you know, lied to by their media 24 hours a day. The truth is this. God loves everybody. 
Everybody is valued before God the same way. And God wants us to heal racism. Now, I'm not naive enough to think that in a 45-minute message, I'm going to give you the answers to this problem. You're going to walk out the door and we are going to change America. But why not? Why not? I mean, change always starts with one or two people. And it spreads like wildfire when people believe it. You know, we got to stop hating. And this is what it's been all about. We got to start loving everyone. And that love comes down to these three principles. I want to send you home with them. How do we heal racism? There's a lot of things that I could say, a lot of principles I could teach, but I want you to look at Acts chapter 15. I think the early New Testament church was plagued, I know it was plagued, by racism and bigotry. You know why? Because the Jews actually thought since God brought the Messiah, or they didn't believe the Messiah had come, at that point, they thought the Messiah had come through the nation of Israel because they were Messianic Jews, and that Israel or Jews were more valuable than everyone else. God never taught that. That's a lie. And so they were racist and they were bigoted. And so this is what we read in the writing of Luke in Acts chapter 15. Look at this. After a long debate, Peter stood up and said, my friends, you know that a long time ago, God chose me from among you, not above you, from among you to preach the good news to who? The Gentiles, so that they could hear and believe. And God, who knows the thoughts of everyone, showed his approval of the Gentiles by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he had to us. He made no difference between us and them. He forgave their sins because they believed. So then, why do you want to put God to the test by laying a load on the backs of the believers, which neither our ancestors nor we ourselves were able to carry? No, we believe and are saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they are. The whole group was silent. I bet they were. As they heard Barnabas and Paul report all the miracles and wonders that God had performed through them to the Gentiles. When they had finished speaking, James spoke up, listen to me, my friends. Simon has just explained how God first showed his care for the Gentiles by taking from among them a people to belong to him. God wants everyone to be saved. Jesus died for everyone. And if you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. That's it. It's pretty simple. And I love the way the half-brother of Jesus teaches this in his book in James chapter 2. He says, you will be doing the right thing if you obey the law of the kingdom, which is found in Scripture. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. But if you treat people according to their outward appearance, you are guilty of sin. And the law condemns you as a lawbreaker. Whoever breaks one commandment is guilty of breaking them all. I quote that verse a lot, but in specific context, it's about racism. It's about prejudice. It's about hatred. He says, don't. You need to love everybody. The royal law of love and acceptance. How do we do it? Well, first, we got to confess our sin and start viewing everyone by the content of their heart, not the color of their skin. And guys, that means literally confessing. On February 29th, next Saturday, God gave us an extra day to pray. And so from 5 a.m. to 5 p.m., we're going to pray here at Grace. And I want to ask you to come. Just come over for an hour. You know, I, I, I would venture to say 5 a.m. to 8 a.m. is going to be the small time. So come on over. And join us as we pray for God's healing in this country, as we pray for God to work in this ministry, as we pray for the specific needs of the 52 ministries in this church, uh, and as we pray for you and whatever prayer requests you may bring, because there's power in prayer. But the bo most important thing we can do is allow God to change our vision, to be colorblind. Look at 1 Samuel 16, 7. First verse I ever memorized in a, in a Christian school in 1979. Here it is. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't look at his appearance or how tall he is because I have rejected him. God does not see as humans see. Humans look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks into the heart. That's what God wants from us. He says, 
confess it, and start seeing everyone as God's children. Guys, I was part of a huge gathering of, of pastors with Promise Keepers 25 years ago. My dad, Jim, uh, a couple other pastors were there. And I was sort of bothered by something that happened. And it was actually a bunch of Native American pastors that came up on the stage in their headgear. And so, you know, this is our, our heritage, our family. The guy that spoke was actually from the Osage tribe, which was unique because that's our tribe or one of them. And, and so at that point, he started talking about, you need to turn to your neighbor and apologize for your racism. And I'm thinking, I'm not racist. I didn't do anything to that guy and he didn't do anything to me. And I, I was sort of bothered by the whole thing that happened. And, and I missed the point. I was offended and I got offended because I missed the point that if at any time I have allowed racism or bigotry or prejudice to not only plague me, but my community, and I've done nothing about it, there needs to be a confession. And confession means to say it is so and say, Lord, I'm going to be part of the solution. You know what else? We must share the gospel with everyone because it's the only hope of healing racism. The only hope is Jesus. You are not going to legislate it. So don't think this president or the next president is going to resolve it or Congress. It comes down to a matter of the heart. Look at Ephesians 2. So he is our peace, Jesus. In his body, he has made Jewish and non-Jewish people one by breaking down the wall of hostility that kept them apart. He brought an end to the commandments and demands found in Moses' teachings so that he could take Jewish and non-Jewish people and create what? One new humanity in himself. So he made peace. He also brought them back to God in one body. How? By his cross on which he killed the hostility. He came with the good news of peace for you who are far away and for those who are near. So Jewish and non-Jewish people can go to the Father in one spirit. Doesn't get any clearer than that, does it? You, Bible is so amazing. It speaks to our current issues. If we're going to heal racism, it has got to be a matter of the gospel. I asked a young man, my, my daughter's dating, uh, Jacob Knox. He's African-American young man in California. And I asked him, I said, Jacob, if a white pastor was going to stand up, you know, for lack of better words, and preach on the uh, racism, what would you want him to say? So he said this. I would want him to talk about the relevance of how racism is impacting each community. He's from, by the way, St. Louis, Missouri. He said, letting people know some of the various forms of racism that is impacting our culture. Also, how sometimes, even though we try to relate, it's truly hard to understand what each different race or environment of people is dealing with. A lot of racism today deals with the unknown. People are afraid, so they treat people with racism. There has been a lack of communication for generations over racism. So I feel as if the best thing to do is let the church know they need to be a part of the communication toward healing and reconciliation that bridges the gaps racism has created. Brilliantly said. And I would say this, we can foster those conversations. We, Grace Church, can be that city on a hill with a diverse nation of people. And by the way, we have got to expand that. Write this down. This is the last way we do it. We must make grace an all-nation congregation mirroring our diverse communities because that's what heaven will be. You know, I, I have been praying along with the elders for years now that God would raise up an African-American pastor to come and step in and, and begin to preach and lead in this community. And here's why. Because they understand clearly some of the challenges that are plaguing black America that I don't. They also have a unique way of communicating God's word. But I'll be honest with you. We're just flat out too boring for most of them. Like, you mean I'm going to preach and nobody's going to say anything? We're going to sing and we ain't dancing? Seriously, you ever been to a black church? I have. I've performed and sang and led worship in them. I've even changed pulpits with the pastor at Macedonia Baptist and had their 40-person choir come over and sing while he preached. And I was like, I am not worthy. 
So uh, you got to find the right person that loves the passion of the gospel and the ministry. And so we're praying for that. We have Hispanic. We have, you know, other different cultures represented, but, but we're not doing a very good job. And you know why we're not doing a good job? We have grown in our diversity in Arvada and the surrounding areas because of gentrification. And the church has got to be prepared for that. So pray with me. I told you last night or Friday night at the concert was a microcosm of heaven. Looking around, seeing people of every tongue, every nation. Look at Revelation 5, 9. This is about the future. Because Jesus was slaughtered for us, he is worthy to take the scroll and open the seals. Your blood was the price paid to redeem us. You purchased us to bring us to God out of every tribe, language, people group, and nation. Guys, I got news for you. When we get to heaven, we don't all turn white. We get to heaven, we don't all turn black. We get to heaven, we don't all turn yellow or red or any. We are who we are. And God says, I want every nation and all the diversity that we can possibly muster to be in heaven. Look at Revelation 7. After this, I looked and behold, right in front of me, I saw a vast multitude of people, an enormous multitude so huge that no one could count it. Picture billions made up of victorious ones from every nation, tribe, people group, and language. They were all in glistening white robes, standing before the throne and before the Lamb with palm branches in their hands, and they shouted with a passionate voice, salvation belongs to our God, seated on the throne and to the Lamb. That's heaven. Now, what can God do through the gospel? Can the gospel really change a heart? Listen, as you're getting ready to pack up, hold on, I want you to hear this. I'm going to pray in just a moment. I want, to, I want you to hear what happened when two white supremacists came to grace. Listen to this. For most of our lives, we've been immersed in the most racial cultures you can imagine. This is Mike and Maureen Walters. From prison gang fights to working for violent white supremacist groups, we've seen horrors done in the name of white power and protection that would turn your stomach if we described them. Discrimination and hatred are powerful, and they stole so many years of our lives, but not anymore. God so loved the world, the whole world, not one race or another, not race by race, but all of us. Racism is sin, plain and simple, and it's, the only, sin, it's only sin that keeps racism going. It's only sin and evil that keep racism alive in our world, because God loves all of us, no matter where we come from, where we live, or what color of skin we have. My name is Maureen. It means little beloved one. And it was given to me when I was adopted at eight days old. I was wanted, I was prayed for, and I was asked for. But my name also comes from the word Mara, which means bitterness. That's been my life, beloved or bitter. I've had to choose which way I'd live. And when I chose bitterness, it not only gave me hatred for myself, it made me hate other people as well. It made me believe what the people around me were telling me, that only my people, my clan, my color, my race mattered. And we had to fight for our power, our respect, and our supremacy. In 2011, my 17-year-old daughter, Victoria, asked if she could introduce me to a man she wanted to date. I was still heavily involved in the white supremacists and neo-Nazis, and she knew it. She knew how racist I was, how much hatred I had in my heart, and she brought him to meet me at the grocery store anyway. I remember the moment I met him, this man my daughter was falling in love with, the man she'd eventually be engaged to, this kind, respectful, loving, admirable black man. Not long after that, my, my daughter died suddenly. Her death was completely unexpected, and we still don't have answers to this day. But I'm so thankful that the last months of her life were good times, and that I didn't let my hate get in the way of accepting this young man that she loved. I'm so glad I chose to see him as a human. I'm so glad my love for my daughter was stronger than my hatred. But I was still caught up in a circle of violent white supremacists, and I knew that if they found out who I'd let my daughter date, I would pay a price. So I sat there with my son, Heath, my computer open at a table at Jack in the Box, deleting every picture I had of my daughter with her fiance, even the ones from her funeral. 
My son begged me to stop. He didn't want his sister's memory erased, but I knew I couldn't keep those pictures. It would cost too much if the people I was connected to found out. So what happens when that kind of hate runs into the love of God? Well, it started when a man named Frank met us in a parking lot and invited us to Grace Church. This church, this beautiful church where people from all different backgrounds, all different races, all different parts of the world get together every week to celebrate God's love for the world. It started when we heard about God's love through Jesus Christ, when we heard about the cross, about the incredible forgiveness of God that even despicable, hateful people like us needed to hear, and we trusted in Jesus and have surrendered our lives to him. God loves the whole world, and somehow even hate-filled eyes and hearts can be transformed by the gospel. That is what happens when hate meets Jesus. And that's what we have to bring to the world. And we have the answer to this seemingly incurable disease of racism, and it's love no matter what. My friends, if you never received that gift, don't leave without it. And if you have received that gift, don't leave here without sharing it. And when you go out into the communities, share Jesus because he will change the hearts of even the most hateful people. Bow your heads and close your eyes for a minute, would you please? If you're here and maybe for the first time ever today, you understood that Jesus died for you, he rose again, and that salvation isn't by being good or being religious or giving up your bad works or doing good things. It's by believing in Jesus and receiving salvation. Then friend, right where you sit, trust in him. Just, just pray this prayer in your mind. God, thank you. Thank you for loving me. I admit I'm a sinner and I now know there's nothing I can do to remove my sins. But I believe that Jesus Christ paid it all, that he did it 2,000 years ago. And right now, I received the free gift of salvation. Thank you, God, for saving me. Friend, in this very moment, you're born again. The Spirit of God lives in you. You're going to heaven. You have purpose. And God is beginning the process of healing whatever brokenness is in you because you're forgiven. I want to pray for you. I'm not going to have you stand up or come forward. In a moment, I'm going to have you raise your hand and put it right back down. That just lets me know that today you got it. So if you're saying, I receive the free gift of salvation, I believe in Jesus, would you just slip your hand up and put it right back down? God bless you. God bless you guys. Thank you. Praise God. God bless you. Welcome to the family of God. We'd love to know who you are, congratulate you, and give you a gift, a new Bible, welcome you to the family of God. Just... Just before you leave, text the word believe to 313131. Just text the word believe. Pastor Scott will give you a call, talk to you this week, just encourage you and let you know all the wonderful ways we can help you grow. Father God, thank you for the free gift of salvation and for the power of the gospel that transforms all of us and takes away our hate and replaces it with love. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we sing, let me just say this. We're making a change when it comes to the act of worship with our finances. Don't worry, we're not passing an offering plate. We're actually gonna pass the actual offering boxes. No, I'm just kidding, I'm not gonna do that. What we are going to do though is make sure that everybody understands that unless you're a guest, you have a responsibility just as I do to give back to God a portion of what he's given. He doesn't care about the amount, he does care about the percentage and he does care about the consistency and he does care about the attitude. And this year, we, I had meetings, I have meetings this whole weekend between services to talk about how we are going to impact lives with basically our version of Make-A-Wish this year and changing many lives depending on what comes in financially. Our goal is 4.2 million. It should be very easy to achieve that, the size of church we are, but it's gonna take everybody participating. Guys, make it your goal to not only give, to give sacrificially and cheerfully. And as we, many of you sit there, many of you watching like, man, I'm, I'm hurting, I'm just, my finances are struggling, I'm in debt, I have school loans. Next week and the week after, we're gonna talk about how God wants to give you the keys to getting out of that debt and really living free. 
So as we give, after Solon and, and the team lead us in worship, make sure that you're faithful in this area. We can't do what we do without you. And I read the other day that the average church in America costs $387 per person to minister to them quarterly. I did all the math. I was like, that's an interesting number. You know what it comes out to for our church our size? 4.2 million. So we're able to do ministry for cheaper than that and take the hundreds of thousands of dollars that may come in above 3.7 and give to those in need connected to our church and through our families, maybe even some of you. Let's sing.